up, which gives you that broader, meatier spirit. So it's a really interesting yin-yang kind of spirit style um, where you've got some beautiful light elements plus a really big, broad, rustic base. Uh, give the, and that's the worm tub. Um, bit of a kooky one. You see it's not circular. Uh, in most worm tubs, worm tub condensers and stills around the world are that classic kind of serpentine coil. Um, there's a few in Scotland that are actually like rectangles, where they massive long tanks and they kind of go rectangularly around. So Linkwood, um, Nocdu, two I can think of, that have those big rectangular ones. Um, but it, yeah, the worm tubs are really, really something special and they give the, the spirit a very unique flavour profile, which that, that big broad style spirit is something that Sullivan's is known for. A lot of interesting delicacies, but it's full. Um, so we, we've, had, we've got one still, this is the original. Um, that's Matt actually, not the still, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt is original. <laughs> <laughs> so, originally, like I said, it was a cognac style still, and we, we now call it like the Franken stills. So we've added bits and bobs. Um, this interesting bit here actually goes all the way to the still and back, which is an after core. It's basically, in essence, an extension of the worm, but outside the tub. Um, that was put in about 15 years ago because the cool, the worm tub waters, the cooling waters that used to be mains, problem was in summer, it just get too hot. <laughs> it just wasn't hot enough to actually condense the, the um, vapors down to the new mate style we were after. So Pat McGuire put in an extra after cooler and at the bottom of that was actually a big esky with lots of copper coil in it and we just tried to ice bucket, buckets of ice in it in the heat of summer. Um, we then had chillers installed to you know, put a bit of consistency into our cooling waters, undid that after cooler and realised the spirit style changed. So we're taking out, those, taking out a bunch of the copper. And so we put it back up. <laughs> Which is, you know, kind of similar to in the story of you know, impact on New Mac style is Dal Winnie, which is the classic, you know, in the 80s or 90s it was. They took out their worm tubs, put in the shell and tube condensers for efficiency, and then realised, oops, spirit style changed completely. So they put the worms back in. And shell and tube condensers are a lot smaller. They're a lot more efficient. They've got a huge, much, much larger amount of copper surface area and they just charge pressurised cold water um, through it. So it's a really quick um, condensing method with a whole lot of copper contacts that purifies it. you a very, very light spirit style. Um, but... It's all about the spirit style you want at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, so this is this is our bag. Uh, we've got, you can see there's some barrels in the background there. One of our points of difference, um, particularly in the Australian scene, having spanned over about 30 years, is that we're using full-size casks. So not the, the small little wee jobbies. Um, we're using big guys. So you're looking at there, I mean, this that one there was a 300 litre, it's a hogshead. And behind it, there's actually some 450 litre Mazanara casks, um, but the vast majority are 300 litre French oak X20s, American oak X20s, or like that one there, which is an American oak virgin cask. So it didn't have fortified or bourbon in it before, um, and American oak virgin casks. So long term aging, big, robust spirit meant for that. And it's got a lot of body to take it through into its geriatric years. Let's give this one a nose. We distill single malt whiskey, so it's all malted barley, Tassie barley. So you can immediately smell like buttery shortbread, malty, malty, malty. Uh, <coughs> but there's also breath, and this is something that's very classic of distilleries that use a worm tub, because there is that extra quantity of sulfur that actually makes it through into the new make. It's quite broad. It gives you a lovely breath. Um, you can often smell, it sounds weird, but like warm sand on the beach, you know, that hot sand, kind of broad peaches, like milk bottles. When you say this is your vodka, yep. is this exactly what's going in the vodka bottles or is... It is. Okay. 
So this is our new make that we've run gently through carbon uh, charcoal filtration. So new make, it, well, it's very similar to this. Uh, it's, it does have a few little rough edges, which of course, so yeah. I put it in a barrel. But to put it in a bottle and brand it as vodka, of course, we do want to polish it up a tiny bit. So we've just taken those little edges off by running it through a little bit of a charcoal filter, which in essence kind of mimics what a barrel does inside of the barrels. You know, fire blasted and charcoal. So um, this is just a, a gentle version. What's the strength of this? The strength of that is 40. Yep, 40%. Tell us your thoughts, Mark. I think it's actually quite drinkable, and despite the forty percent, it doesn't it doesn't drink that low. I think it's got a, a bit of punch to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to drink this instead of a, a gin, to be honest. I don't, it doesn't sort of drink like a standard vodka, but I guess being made from older barley instead of your potato or your grains is the, yeah. the main difference there. I know when you guys did the gin, the, the number four was it? Yep. Again, that was from your malted yep. again. So it's because there's. Cause there's it's a bit of a misconception in Tasmania, and I know a lot of people love Tasmania gins, but realistically, there's only about five percent of the actual ingredients that go into Tasmania gin. It's actually Tasmanian because most Tasmania gins imported from the mainland. They get a neutral spirit, and then they'll add a botanicals basket to their still, and they'll run it through that. And the primary ingredient in gin is juniper, and you can't grow it in Tassie. So when you drink a Tasmania gin, yeah, it's probably bottled here and labelled here, and Manufactured here, but there's not a lot of Tassie going at the bottle, unfortunately. The Sullivan's was one of the few. Hobart Whiskey do some, I think Mark Lofty might do their own. But yeah, you can count on one hand the, the actual Tassie gin that's actually in Tassie new make. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, uh, yeah, the main difference being it is based on malted barley, which the vast majority of neutral spirits are not. Uh, and so there is a, a lot of that buttery multi flavor but also we run through a pot still uh, which the vast majority of neutral spirits are run through column stills so they've got a much higher purity uh, ethanol of course it's like nearly 100 percent and uh, therefore not the, the flavor profile that's much more neutral um, so this is a yes it's vodka but it's got a lot of character which is quite cool it's very good yeah also awesome. yeah, yeah. screams for a martini <coughs> Absolutely, yeah, slightly dirty blue cheese already. <laughs> already. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, okay. we really, really love sharing this uh, before we go into our whiskies because, and we talk a lot about terroir, which is a classically, you know, French wine term re referring to like the, the presence of the place in a, in a drink or in food. Whereas this, that is terroir, that is Tasmania. That is Tasmanian barley. Fermented and distilled in Tasmania in a pot still, which allows you to retain all of those place characteristics. And it's just Tasmanian bottle. It's fantastic. It's the base of all of our spirit. Uh, and we chuck it in a barrel. So let's jump over to the next Sally's dram, which is spot on in the middle. Just before we leave, the, sorry, the sorry, Mark. Yep. Is, um, is this easily accessible to Alley and retail stores in, in Launceston or? No, I believe it's sold out now. No, it's sold out. Like, 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 like the gin sold out. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible confession. You um, might see it around if you're lucky. Right. So, yeah. but, yeah. um, my terrible buy drum vodka confession is that my partner Sarah and I made lemon cello with some of the last ones. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Mark. Yeah. 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 Hi Matt. <laughs> okay. Dram dram number one. You may have seen on the shelves or on the website or on social a box like this, and the bottle has the I call it pate coloured. We all have our own kind of <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Sorry, another thing of pattern. That's a nice kind of dusty pink uh, stripe through the black label. When you see Sullivan's bowls that have a black label, American oak, think Quercus alba, American oak, uh, and the stripe will indicate what the pre-fill was, or in this case, the lack thereof, because this this barrel, which is actually just like that one I pointed to with the red ring around it in the photo. Uh, has never had fortified wine in it, has never had bourbon in it, it's only ever had our spirit in it. And this is the second time round 
uh, the field dates for this one, filled on the 29th of November 2005, and we decanted it on the 6th of April this year. So that's 15. Um, that's the second time around. So in between uses, we took it off to the cooper, set it the light, did a nice little toasty and a char, and uh, put our new make back in it. Uh, so American oak with no pre-fill is going to give you a whole lot of like pastry, vanilla driven flavour profiles, quite caramelly, which work really, really well with your classic malt bomb sully spirit, uh, and particularly well with that really broad sulphur, sulphury worm type spirit. And I'm unashamedly using the word sulphur because that's what it is. And it, I unashamedly um, am a little bit upset in the, the whiskey industry worldwide when we talk about sulphur as a byword. Sulphur is in everything. It is part of organic matter. It happens when you ferment something. It happens when anything breaks down. It happens when you ferment things, when you distill things. It happens in the barrel, and that's okay. There's loads of different sulphur compounds. Some of them smell like fart and rotten eggs. It's true. A lot of them don't. And a lot of the, I mean, it's over 30% of Diageo's distilleries have worm tubs. Because the best blends in the world and the way to get a good blend is to use the worm tub in at least a portion of it. It gives you breadth. You can marry it with some of the lighter spirits and make a beautiful blend. And that's what Scotch has been doing forever. Uh, so for us to say that sulphur in whiskey is bad or a sign of a fault is stupid. Actually, it's it's a real disappointment. Sulphur in whiskey, thumbs up. Some sulphur is a bit stinky and can be a sign of fault, but for the most part, it's a benefit and it's something that makes whiskey broad and delicious. This year, technically, chemically speaking, is a sulphur bomb. There's so many things, chemical compounds in here that are actually sulphur related. Gives you that breadth, gives you that depth. Uh, really, really accentuates the malt character uh, and texture, interestingly as well. It's a, it's a big contributor to texture, and that's something we uh, particular about at Sullivan's is accentuating uh, the texture that we get from using old school strains of barley, doing long and slow ferments, and uh, still just the nature of the, and shape of the still will really accentuate that as well. Um, so please enjoy. I'd love to hear what you all think. Uh, so Virgin American Oak Cask, second build, it's only had our spirit in it. Loads of vanilla, loads of malt. I love it. Fortune first to love it. Yeah. Stop like it. So as always here at the star, you know, when asked, not not all that someone else is talking at the front, but when asked, we do encourage interaction and to share out uh, some some tasting notes. We do have a terrible prize for tonight that I've chosen from my fifty mil selection, the <laughs> fabulous sheepdog peanut butter whiskey. So it's sort of a booby oh. prize. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, got that. <laughs> so yeah, do, do feel free to share taste and notes or anything that could be in the run for the prize. Um, with, I'll, I'll probably choose that one. So yeah. <laughs> 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 On the nose, candy floss.
Absolutely, lavender, you hit the nail on the head, my friend. Um, we run our condensers fairly hot. Yeah. Condenser, we actually have one, apologies. We're, we run at the waters through our worm tub, historically fairly warm. Yeah. Lavender is an absolutely classic warm worm tub note. Absolutely classic. Very, very, very well said. Uh, so I'll take the candy for be careful. <laughs> It's really interesting we're going to be tasting Krigeliki um, this evening because they have they run a lot more cool water quite like rapidly through their condensers, way faster than we do and a lot cooler than we do, which means that the condenser happens faster. So there's less of the vapor phase contact with the copper because it cools down a lot quicker and all of a sudden it's condensed into a liquid. Which and the vapor phase is where you've got much more reactivity between the, the vapor, like the ethanol vapors. And the copper, so you get a lot more of that purifying uh, sort of reaction rea reactions happening. So Kugelik is really interesting because they they charge a whole heap of cold water quite rapidly through their condensers, which means it's quite fast. That results in a slightly heavier spirit, it's less of the purifying happening. Um, and then you know, of course, you all think about what uh, the, I would say the principal, the Scotch distilleries with the worm top. Um, they do the same thing, but they've even got this little thing that sprays cold water on the top of the line arm before it goes into the um, condenser, which is it's like there. So they're just like, chill that out, chill it, chill it, chill it. <laughs> and so you get that really, really big, gutsy, rustic, meaty spirit, which is, you know, the more luck that we all love. Um, whereas uh, a barn, uh, any, any of the others. Royal Lock Vigar, they do kind of similar to us, so that the condenser water is a bit warmer. And so you get more of the vapour flowing for a bit of a longer coil, so it's more vapour contact time with the copper. So you get more of a Now, even if you run it and you get Like hiding holes. Yeah. It's quite an insurance, and I always forget that when these shells do condenser, it looks like you know a round fancy fish bowl because it's made out of copper and it's standing there. Because there's a lot of copper coming in contact with that, but in actual fact, there's more copper with the shell and juice in contact with the tubs, hence it's got more sulfurous on the spirit. But it sort of can there must be heaps of copper contact because it's the shell tube is basically like this shell, so it's like a vacuum pipe, copper pipe, and then there's loads of hundred, literally like a hundred tiny thin copper pipes going up, being pumped all around it rapidly. Uh, so it's, it's a lot of copper contact if you like looked 
good surface areas compared to the worm, which got, got mm -hmm. nice. Shelling tubes are also known as shoddies or shotgun condensers. Mm -hmm. You kind of looked up under it, it'd, you'd have lots of holes kind of looking like down the barrel. And I'm sure Matt will cover this as well, but um, I was having been promoting the, the virtues of sulfur. Unfortunately, sulfur is used in two ways in, in whiskey terminology. And one is a less desirable sulfur note that people associate with sulfur candles that they use to treat the bacteria in Spanish sherry casks pre mid 90s. I think they've stopped it or outlawed it now. It's the same but, in Australia. Yeah. It's, not, it's not a thing we do anymore. No, so it does mean that older whiskies from that era, some of the sulfur, the rotten egg type sulfur that you're smelling, is from the cask, not from the spirit. So nearly everyone agrees that spirit sulfur is desirable, but cask sulfur not so much. But unfortunately, because it's the same terminology, um, people throw it around and when they yeah. hear that, that something's sulfur affected, they, they don't like it. So. It's, it's a really big umbrella term. <clears throat> Sulfur is a huge umbrella term. It's like saying there's a car on the road. <laughs> I don't like cars. They can all get stuff. It's literally like saying that. <laughs> you could like three mates of cars and not seven. It, it's a really big umbrella term. So think of it like that. Yeah. So one of the other things I personally love about Sullivan's Cove is the transparency. Um, feel free to pass around the box, but they all have these, these great little labels and I'll bring up my only two salons, but um, it'll tell you exactly the casks that, that are on the side. And uh, I was very fortunate that, that my wife gifted me a Sullivan's Co. bottle about four years ago, back um, when the double cask was somewhere between $100 and $150, I think, to buy. And it's full of Highland Holdings X casks. And um, Highland Holdings are the ones that frequently win um, the awards. And Highland Holdings is actually the concrete company that for a time owned Sullivan's Cove. So. But Heather can probably tell you a little bit more about that than I can. Yeah, so hey, if you see the barrels, uh, actually, let's pass this around. Um, we call this the birth certificate. We're predominantly a single cast distillery, so, you know, I'd like to tell you everything about that single cast. You know, it's an it's a individual, and we um, kind of personify them. Sometimes probably we'll go too far. But, <laughs> We do tend to personify them, you know, each cast goes through multiple tasting panels until we decide, yeah, she's she's balanced, she's complex, she ticks the boxes, let's get her out. Um, but when we do, we give you all the info. So there's the barrel number, how many bottles came out of it, obviously there's ABV standard drinks, and the day we filled it and then decanted it. So let's pass that around. Um, on the double cast, just that you can kind of see all the different like prefixes. Of the barrels because we'll list every barrel that went in to the batch but this one this is a td so that the, the prefix td refers to an era of, of ownership that's the distillery and hh refers to another one not yet but you'll see sc at some stage which refers to our current and most recent ownership period so each of them is referring to a period of the company uh hhs have been you know winning awards for a very long time uh tds as well uh and I trust you'll be seeing SCs on some award gongs as well, but you might have to wait for years. <laughs> We've, um, what are we, in year five, year five of the current ownership period, so yeah. still got a few years to go before we start seeing them hit the back with bottles. Because with the exception of your pilot cast, which is only available yes. from the cellar door, yep. everything that's commercially released is at least 10 years old still, is that basically? We don't have an alarm bell or time minimum or maximum. Uh, we're very much focused on letting each ind individual barrel be bottled at its individual readiness. So it is very much, it sounds cheesy, I'm sorry, not sorry, we listen to the liquid, you know, it's letting each barrel tell us when it wants to be out in the, into the world and in your glasses. Um, so we've released whiskey in, in recent years, I remember a nine-year-old and, and, you know, looking at the quality of what's coming down the line, I think that's, that's going to happen again. Um, we're certainly not putting alarm bells in the bond store at age eight or 10 or 12 and saying, all right, out you get. It really is up to each barrel. So sometimes it'll be nine, 10, 11, 12, other times it'll be 20 plus. It's up to the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Does anyone have any questions for Heather? We're really lucky to have Heather and her team here today. So don't, don't hesitate to ask any questions at all. Andrew's got one, he's just dying to ask. <laughs> I can make one up.
<laughs> so the, the cellar door is open currently seven days a week. Um, it is an amazing tool to go and do. There's always something you can buy from the cellar door. Sometimes you can't always buy Sullivan's Cove whiskey online. In fact, frequently you can't. It's usually by a ballot these days. But the cellar door, if you can make it down to Cambridge, they will always have something there that they're able to sell you so you can own your own bottle of wonderfulness. Um, <laughs> we don't have any bottles for sale today, but we, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, the offering that they've shared with us and, and the new make, which is apparently a sold out vodka, which also you can't get. <laughs> so really you just have to do this. So it's basically an experimental label, of, but particularly things that don't fit our main skews. Um, and everybody who has a bond store, well, all of us here have bond store, but everyone who has a bond store doesn't just have three hundred of hours in there. We've got all sorts of things. We've got majority French oak toys, American oak toys, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we've got some weird stuff too. Sometimes we like to do things that's a bit odd, like recent, the most recent file cast, which is still available at the cellar door. Um, we made a little small batch DC and finished it in a brand cask. Tell me which Solomon's Cove label that's going to go into. It's an experiment and it's a unique offering and it's something that we think would be a really great offering for the cellar door to have for visitors who make the hike. Yeah. It's an amazing drum. Yeah, you've had it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, we got questions. Where are you estimating the next quarter? <laughs> <laughs> We're not. I don't know. Um, we haven't thought about releasing any further, uh, but certainly if you are keen, I can see what we can do about it. It's, it's not something that we, you know, vodka and gin were things that we have in the past released. Um, this sounds bad, but there's a lot of white spirits on the market and we feel like our spirit's best in a barrel and we're known, we're renowned, we're no notoriously renowned for barrel aged spirits. So as the head of production, I kind of think we'll just chuck the damn thing in a barrel. That's where it kind of belongs. But it is something that we do make small amounts for for the cellar door because like I was saying earlier, it's a really nice thing to, to share before a tasting. Um, but we have stopped making white spirits and bottling them out uh, because we feel that we're barrel aged spirit specialists and there's plenty of white spirits on the market. <laughs> we don't need to be adding another one. And they're so coming out of one, one still. Yes. Not a bad one, or are you trying to keep your market small? As in do building we, another still? expansion? We're looking at a small expansion yeah. without move down to the waterfront. Small, okay. meaningful, but small. Um, we could bust out and get seven stills and go ham. Yeah, but that would work. Watch um, no, but it's, it's, it's not us. It's no. not us from a from a philosophy point of view, no. our brand and who we are. Um, but also the way we operate is quality. Yeah. Small quantity, high quality. So we'll have a bit of an expansion, but it won't be much. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, keep it all small, going slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whilst they're moving away from the white spirit, they, they are now doing a lot of brandy and winning awards for that. So um, do keep your eye out for brandies and see them in local bottle shops or if you make it down to the cellar door because that is excellent also. Hence having a brandy cast to <laughs> put a double cask into the bottle cask. Mm -hmm. yes. um, well, that is not Sullivan's Coke, so I think I'm going to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Because we do have so many whiskies, we're probably not going to have as many breaks and interminglings and whatnot. So do feel free to, to take a break and knock on the door when you need to be let back in or just chock it open when you go out. Um, we shouldn't interfere with the cinema. Um, now they've all gone in and, and, the, and the movie doesn't come out till 11. So we will move on to Krigeliki and I'll bring up um, our guest host for Krigeliki shortly. 
This is their distillery. And as per um, the bold red lettering up the top there, which used to stay White Horse, which is another blend that this distillery would go into, it now says John Dewars and Sons. So you're welcome, Dram, today, as is traditional. It's a blended Scotch um, whiskey, but it's primary, one of the primary single malts that go into it is Kregeliki. So you've got a, a, a Dewar's white label um, on offer, which was in the welcome drink if you hopefully picked that up on your way through. So just bear with me and I'll get Matt up. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. There we go. Hey. It's like radio. Okay. You're tuned to that. Tuned to that. Um, so, um, much like um, I was saying about the transparency with the cool little birth certificate that Hell explaining, uh, Matt's from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. We love the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society here at um, the Star. I finish every one of my whiskey events at the Star with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society bottling. They're very transparent with everything except the name of the distillery on the label. But if you have a look at that, it's a very transparent brand. So Matt's very kindly agreed to do Kregeliki today to give my voice a bit of a rest. Um, he has the entire lineup himself there that I shipped over, or Ali shipped over to a credit. Um, thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ali. So I'll hand over to Matt. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. I am getting some. Give me a wave. Give me a wave. Give me a wave. Give me a wave. I can see you all. See you all. Um, um, this is so this exciting. Is so exciting. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do things, things. things and and I have to put my put my phones half way. Half way. Well, actually, that's 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 um, I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna walk things and and tell you a bit about the society, a bit about the like the distillery. Um, um, Heather has already nerfed me big time. Big time. On um on clubs. Got your back, Matt. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I'm, no, not I'm not going to talk too much because, because, because we could, uh, we could uh, make, this, uh, make this scientific dissertation and, uh, and we and, can uh, and we all my all 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 Um, really strong. Okay. Okay. Uh, here we go. Uh, here we go. Happy out to Happy out to labor. Today's out to today. Today's out to today. Festive out to today. That we will usually today. All of our Christmas past in the past. And this tasting tonight is decidedly quite Tasmanian. We've got a big chat up for Jeremy Yu here. We've got a cover for us. Jeremy is a clerk, which I'm not sure he's the best in the world in Tasmania. Um, um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's Jeremy, Jeremy Custom Custom commissioned, we commissioned, we commissioned him to make this art to our art term because in the previous years, our Christmas art term has all been so blue and cost in the year. It's like, that's not Christmas. Big thanks to Jeremy. Now, I had a chat with our chat with manager, Tom Ross, who said he couldn't be tasting tonight. Um, um, and he said that he there's said someone that there's in the room, room where you are right, you now, are right now, who has who has to say to say to say I'm going to say it all to right now. So, uh, so Tom informed me earlier today that Ellie can't say Kregeliki. I'm going to teach you all how to say the story tonight. That's a really good point for us to start. So he's Glenn Livet. Now, lean onto the second syllable. And we'll all and be we'll one right? 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 So I say Glenn Livet. Can I hear you all say Glenn Livet? Yeah, second yeah, syllable. Second syllable. Now, next now, one. Next one. Glenn Murray. Glenn Murray. Let's hear it. Glenn Murray. Yeah, second yeah, syllable. Second yeah, second syllable. Kregeliki. Kregeliki. That kind of hear Ali say it? Ali say it? And of course, and of course um, a new one that's just been coined up tonight, tonight uh, is, of course, uh, course a distillery in Tasmania called. Ah, there it is. <laughs> so, Groot, so Groot, 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 Groot. Groot. 
there's the Cronella Bridge, bridge where it's, uh, it's uh, the, the idyllic place, place of Cronella. I, I don't know what size you'll be showing. I can see. But uh, I can but show you that I can one. Show you, that one. Parts, parts. you can see there's you so, see much, there's around so much around there. Hillary. Hillary. Uh, what are we uh, sipping on? Are we on the first thing? Just enjoy that. Just enjoy that. Mark, you're on top in there. What am I jumping in for? What are we sipping? Uh, so, so the first quick elegant dram is their, their original bottle of the 13-year-old. Yeah, let, let's yeah, let's tuck in that so pen is actually on the first part. You can actually you can see, see, see that the distillery, the distillery, the distillery, the the distillery, the the distillery, 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 the now, I'll just tell you a little, little tidbits about the society before. before. I, I know some of your members already. already. For those who don't know, this one's fun. Here's Pip Hills. Pip Hills. Pip Hills. Grumpy Sod that he is. This is the guy who founded this Scottish Boys Society. He founded it with a group of friends called the Syndicate that turned into a whiskey club, and he was determined to bottle it. This wasn't really done. This wasn't really done. This is an this, this is nineteen eighty three when single malts were really popular. Whiskey was on the rise. Walkers, you know, Walkers, 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 no one would want a bar of it. They're like, yeah, fine. Take whatever you want. Take whichever casks you want from the warehouse. No one drinks single malt. Why would you bother doing this? Uh, that's where it all started with Pip, and that's where 1.1 started. Mark said we're pretty transparent at the society. Uh, that's entirely true. Oh, has that, has that feedback dropped off now? Can you all still hear me? Hear me? Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Matt, I'll just mute us and we're not talking because it fixes the feedback problem. Oh, perfect. Oh, Thank perfect. you, Mark. There's 1.1. Um, that's where it all started. Distillery one, cask number one. Uh, so that the numbering system came about basically because it was the first one that he sourced. He talked to, to John Grant, John Grant at Glen Farkless and sourced that first cask, uh, which was a quarter cask, eight year old sherry whiskey. Uh, I would love to taste one dot one. I know some people have tasted one dot two and dot three in Australia, but I don't know of anyone who's gotten around to one dot one. Not even Tom, and Tom thinks he's tasted everything. So there's one dot one. Um, and the sort of the, the genesis of the society was the distillery code followed by distillery number. Some of the early bottlings of 1.1 actually had the word Glen Farkles written on the bottle, but John Grant tasted it and then said, you know what, this is kind of objectively better than what we're bottling, so can you please hide our distillery name off it? Um, then Pip bought the vaults, which is in Leith, uh, the, where it all started for us, the Scotchmont Whiskey Society, and there they are. Uh, once international travel res resumes, I encourage you all to make the pilgrimage. It, what a venue. It, it's You can stay at the vaults. You can stay in the rooms upstairs. It's such a fantastic community and group of members around the world, of which I know many of you in the room tonight are members. Uh, there's Pip holding 1.1 to give you some context. That's about as much of a smile as you'll ever crack out of Pip. Um, like I said, he, he specializes in being a grumpy sod. He doesn't have anything to do with the society much anymore these days, but he's still our founder and where it all began. And uh, it'd be very cool to be hold, even holding a bottle of 1.1 would be a, a bit of a special moment. These days, a lot of it has to do with Ewan Campbell. There he is doing some blending, doing some mixing. I'm, I'm sure it's mostly posed, but see, that's Ewan. He's the sort of the palette behind everything we do at the Society. He has one of the best palettes in whiskey in the world, full stop. Um, he's an absolute, he's turning into quite the blender and quite the sort of creator of great whiskey. Um, and a lot of what we do at the Society these days with Ewan is all sort of tempered by the work that we collaborate with, with the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, which is palate training and, and critical analysis of spirit, uh, some of which we've even done locally as well with myself and a few others. Um, there's some of the SWRI team, the Scotch Whiskey Research Institute team that we work with closely on the development of spirit. In fact, the bloke on the far right is Dr. Forrester. We loved him so much we hired him. He now is uh, head of spirits education and training at the Society. Um, and some of the work that goes into the analysis and assessment and quality of what we're bottling. So I'm hoping that can shine through in what we actually ends up in the glass for us as we taste through these whiskeys. I hope you're all enjoying that 13. 
Um, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I've, I've got a few things to talk about with the other ones, but um, how far on we go. There is something I just want to touch on very briefly about our relationship with Craig Ellicke Distillery. It's assigned code 44. So I might sort of be a bit coy and say, you know, oh, I don't know what distillery 44 is. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it is Craig Ellicke Distillery. Um, it is part of the Bacardi family and we have a great relationship with them. As you've seen from the codes, we're up to 134 for this recent one and even once 114 with the other whiskey tonight. Oh, sorry, 116, sorry. Um, did I say 114? Anyway, 116, yeah. So, um, but I just want to show this bottling here, 44.1. Distilled April 75, bottled July 87. Uh, this is a rather cool piece of sort of whiskey like history right here for a number of reasons. It's the first 44. But second of all, I want to bring this point home that uh, this, this 44 is the first time that this distillery was bottled as a single malt. So we actually bottled this whiskey. So we bottled, we were bottling single malt from this distillery before they were. Now that's, that blows my mind. There's a few distillery codes like that uh, where the society was gladly bottling their spirit as single malt whiskey. In fact, single cask, single malt whiskey at cask strength before the distillery was. Uh, not because they just didn't get around to it, it's just because it, it wasn't on the importance of their radar. This is everything went into blends. Um, everything for them went into Whitehorse and, and Dewars. So this is a cool piece of that history. In fact, uh, one of our panellists, uh, Angus McRail, who does some of his own bottlings these days under Whiskey Sponge and a few other things, uh, legendary bloke, um, and there he is holding 61.1, the first ever Brewer bottled as a single malt. So we were bottling Brewer before Brewer was. I mean, this is this is part of our history and part of our story of championing championing single malt whiskey. And I think that's really exciting for us to to bring to you tonight as well. And so we can taste where that sort of led up to. Um, I don't know. I sort of brought it up to here to talk about 44.134. Mark, where, where are we up to? Earth to Mark. Earth to Mark. Yeah, we're still on the... The first one, the OB. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, okay. okay. I can I can pour, pour a bit of that. Pour a bit of that. There's there's always a certain pineapple note to um to the distillery. Um some of that will come through from the fact that we've uh, as as Heather's talked about, uh the distillery character, the sulfurous note to it, and there was a comment that you said before, Mark, which I, I agree with, but also we'll just contest a little bit. Um, sulfur, it, we often d d regard um, spirit sulfur as, as a positive and cask sulfur as a negative. While I agree broadly, I've met so many people in my journey who actually love cask sulfur and they actually really relish that sort of dirty nature that a cask sulfur has given in the past. And as you've talked about we don't see really sulfur candles in production in, in use of antibacterial use anymore. So that's not really a, a problem anymore, but it's, and it was a problem, but, and I, I certainly ha still have some society bottlings uh, in my cupboard, which are very, well, I remember being hugely cask sulfur and they, they were much earlier bottlings, but they were, this is not something that is, it's not for everyone's tastes, but it's also not, um, not desirable, not undesirable to everyone. Uh, and, it, it's very much a as as I, I liked I liked Heather's analogy of cars. Uh, you know, that's a car, sort of. You know, that's a truck. I mean, they're they're all sort of they all come together, and it's it, it's such a broad brushstroke to for it. But this distillery is one of those few distilleries in Scotland. It's only a handful. Like I, the number always changes, but I'm going to say around 13, 14 distilleries that still use worm tubs, and um, and, and like I said, it's a it's a very old fashioned and I guess old school way of making whiskey, not using shell and tube. Um, but shell and tube was implemented too because that was sort of almost a sign of the times. It was, it was, uh, it was efficiencies, but it was also what people wanted the, the, that clean, um, you know, stripped out profile for, for clean blending and for, and what people, what the, where the market was for that spirit. And I, I think that's really worth hammering home. I mean, it's not like we, these, they weren't mistakes. I mean, no other company on earth apart from Diageo DCL uh, are, are good at ripping out worm tubs. They've, they've got a history of taking them out and replacing them with shell and tube and efficiencies. But it, it's more a sign of the times where there's actually new distilleries now being built in Scotland that are starting with worm tubs. And I think that's all. It's it's almost like we've we've we reached a point where we say, oh, okay, we 
we did really well at one point and we could do a lot better. And I think that's kind of exciting rather than just relying on on everything else everything else in that story. Um, so uh, where are we? Oh, here I am. Okay. So Matt, everyone's pretty much finishing up on their first tram. Yep. Um, yep. Which was the OB release, and we'll move on to the to the to the IB, which has been cut to I think forty six percent or something. The um, Douglas and Lane, while you continue talking about Krigelki. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, look, this, uh, it's uh, yeah. I was, I was going to say before, it, it's it is one of those distilleries where there's. Um, it, it, where, where the character of the spirit has been often discussed and has been part of blending and, and part of process for such a long time. And it's also one of those distillers where they, they actually do really excel at um, at such a broad brushstroke of of age statement and and um, and capacity. So I've tasted, I've actually recently tasted a seven-year-old um, car strength whiskey from this distillery. And from Krigelik, I keep saying this distillery. We have a habit of not saying distillery names at the society. It's all about sort of the flavor and and, and the community, not the not the the marketing and the names. But um, uh, we yeah, it, I tasted recently a, a six and a half, seven year old spirit from this distillery, and it was fantastic. It was purely like uh, really bright, like um, tinned pineapple juice in a glass. And I was very lucky to taste the. Uh, I was invited to taste the fifty one year old uh, Krigelik that they released. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, and when whiskey gets to that age, uh, I'm not I'm not really a huge fan of really old whiskey. I find a lot of it to be a little bit more sort of hype and and crystal decanters rather than actually great spirit in the glass. But that is one of those spirits that did hold up really well after 51 years. And apparently, there was 51 bottles produced worldwide, and blah 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 has all this sort of mythical story behind it. But I I just think it's it's more about the um, it was more about the fact that it was such a great nosing whiskey, and that's one of the differences between old and young spirit. But I mean, not not many uh, not many distilleries I find have that sort of breadth of of sweet spot across their age statements. That's why we've got we have got some young and some moderately old uh, spirit on tonight as well, which is great. And I, I I personally think this distillery excels at teenage years. So Matt, we might take a two minute break here just to allow everyone to have a quick pump of stock and I'll refill some water bottles um, go for, and, go for. and we'll reconvene and, and crack on into the, the next few whiskies. I'll see you in a bit. See you in a bit.
That's the old Providence. Yeah. Yeah. So has everyone finished that or started? Yeah. So yeah, we're out on the on the old Providence slash the Claxton, so a couple away from the SMWS. If you have anything to say about the other bottlings, feel free, Matt. Yeah, sure. Mark, do you want to spin the camera back around or? There's everyone. Hello again. <laughs> um, again, I'm, I'm yeah, just going to start, start. start by apologising, Ali, for putting you on the spot. I hope now you've um, you've learned how to say the distillery name. Wow! Wow! Uh, I'm going to be honest, I wish I was actually there. Uh, I can't get into Tassie until after the 15th of December or something. Um, but um, I wish I was there because I could then uh, present this all to you in person as well. I think we're up to the Claxtons. Uh, I think that's where we're up to. It, it's a 10-year-old Claxtons, I think. Now, some independent bottlers, I'm not going to name names, uh, bring their whiskey down to 46%. To, it's probably non-chill filter. It's probably natural color. I don't know anything about this bottling. Um, in fact, I know very, very little about this bottler to begin with. But um, it's this is what I'll what I'll talk about instead in relation to this is this is one of a few distilleries that uh, can safely be called a dressing malt, uh, one of the more desirable uh, malt whiskies that are used by blenders and desired by independent bottlers. Uh, to bottle, especially more and more since they've since about 2004, 2005, when they first released their own single malts. Um, this is, oh, sorry, first marketed their own single malts, I should say. I'm going to be really accurate in my words here. I know, I know someone will pull me up on if I say it wrong, so that's all right. Um, but it's a uh, marketing it as a single malt is, is relatively, it's a relatively young process for them. And this is what we'd call a dressing malt. Other distilleries like that would be called Klein Leash. Uh, or um, uh, inch gower to some to some extent as well. There are some distilleries out there that are, are very desirable in their malt profile to fill a blend out and and give it a body and character that uh, distillers and sorry that blenders and bottlers really want. Um, I did take some. I've got some photos to show of the distillery. They're very very squat. Is that, is that coming up all right? Very very squat stills down the bottom um, and in in process there. And I, that is not the worm tubs at the distillery. I took a photo of them and I cannot find for the life of me that photo. Those are the worm tubs at Talisker. But those, it gives you an idea of what they look like. I'm, I'm sure Mark, you had a photo up before of what worm tubs look like. But they are filled with water. They've got the worm in them. And at Kregeliki, it's about 100 meters of piping. Um, but at the distillery, that the, the spirit travels, that the vapors travel on that one. Um, where are we up to? So I mentioned before about you know UDV um, uh, and uh, sorry yeah United Distillers and now since and it became part of DCL they it was part of Whitehorse Group for a long time Whitehorse was bought out by DCL DCL became Diageo and um, 20, 2004 or five was when they first came out with single malt but there was um they they lost the distillery unfortunately in fact they they it was an anti competition thing and they couldn't keep it so Bacardi ended up buying it. And it's the only distillery in the Bacardi family, along with uh, Altmore, Brackler, 
Uh, I, uh, I'm having a mental blank now. Aberfeldy. That that's the only of their five distilleries in, within the Bacardi family that actually still have worm tubs. So it's it's really cool that we get able to taste this kind of spirit. And this, you can actually with this Claxton, you can get an idea of what the role of an independent bottler is. In, in many ways, is to showcase a different side of the distillery, to uh, take these casks, have a bit of fun with them, see what they could do with them. I, I don't know what the philosophy or mo of Claxtons is. I, I don't know. I know very little about Claxtons as a, as a bottler. Uh, and I don't know who their who their blender is or who their um, anything like that is. So, uh, but I I, I I trust you're enjoying. It. I, I'm enjoying it. It's it's I would call this a very raw uh, raw profile kind of dram to do with with the distillery. Very um uh, in your face, n no E150, no sort of nonsense, but very enjoyable. Well, yeah. Question from Andrew. Throw it up, throw it up. Alcohol comment yeah. on the Claxtons. So, that, so much like, so much like the SMWS, the Claxtons are. This is a single cast, cast strength, natural cast strength release. So, um, this one is cast strength. Yeah, fifty-five point three percent. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, single cast Berlin Hogshead. Um, Seventy-two of three hundred and forty bottles. Claxton's a relatively new uh, independent bottler. They have some uh, a beautiful estate outside Glasgow with some bonded warehouses. And as far as I'm aware, the only importer into Australia is Nick's Wine Merchants, and they're, they're exclusively they do these releases and they do a exploration series of 50 percent, which is also been very good. Sorry, same bottle style. No, so the single cast ones are these massive. I don't know if you've seen the bottle, mate. This massive, like perfume bottle, like. It's insanely horrible bottle. But, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you said it, Mark, because, because it's true. It's an it's insanely true. horrible it's bottle design. Yeah. Well, the exploration we've featured here before uh, at the Campbelltown night, and they have a, a gold coin under the under the lid, and apparently if you take it to the distillery, you get an option to buy a special All right. Well, um, any more questions? Hi yeah. everyone, so if you've enjoyed the Claxtons, we're going to move into the Scotch Mole Whiskey Society box, which is uh, Matt's forte, so yeah, I'll put it on mute again, but please give me a bit full attention and we'll go from there. Cool. So uh, we're moving into 44.134 now, is that right Mark? Sorry, just you can thumbs up on that one or, yep, all good. Okay. 44.134, Super Trooper. Now, Mark said to me, um, he said to me some weeks ago that he was hosting this night tonight with you guys in Lonnie, and he wanted to um, feature a Society 44, and he was going to put the 44.116 uh, in the lineup, the uh, Pirate Ship in the Storm. Now, I'll get to Pirate Ship in the Storm, but I said, wouldn't it be great if we could put in the lineup, and I'll send you a bottle of, the, of something a bit more sort of like, uh, nuanced and a bit more sort of like let, let's not blow our faces off kind of whiskey. Uh, and I, I had a bottle of Super Trooper sitting in my office, this one here on the screen. And this is in our spicy and sweet flavor profile. We have 12 flavor profiles at the Society that we use to uh, help identify. Uh, you can see here it is distilled on the 9th of June 2004. Spaceside refill X bourbon barrel 55.1% after 16 years in cask. I would call this, the example of this would be uh, one of the most uh, uh, typical, one of the most like stereotypical examples of a great Speyside whiskey. Um, there's there's what I like to call the younger style of whiskeys, which are sort of those six, seven, eight, nine-year-old whiskeys, which you, which you taste, which are very much um, brisk, very spirit forward. Uh, and that, that's, can, that can be hugely enjoyable. Uh, and I love that kind of whiskey. I, I mean, I love uh, a youthful spirit where I can actually taste the spirit character. Then you have whiskeys that are 24, 50, 24 to 35 to 45 years of age. And those are the kind of whiskeys that are, uh, are very uh, sedate, very um, relaxed, very nuanced, very complex, but often can be quite cask driven, can be a lot of cask profile. Uh, it's very, one of the reasons, if, you, if anyone wants to ever know why, a 25 or 30 year old whiskey is so expensive uh, is because you have to understand to begin with how few casks actually make that kind of age. Heather sort of touched on this before about that question about when is, 
when is the when is the Sullivan's Cove bottled? And it's not when it reaches a certain age. It's when you find it ready. We have the same process at the society. I'm so glad that Sullivan's borrowed this process off us. We're, we're very appreciative. Um, we have that same process at the society where the whiskey is ready when it's ready and it's bottled when it's ready. It's not when it reaches a certain age. We have a whiskey coming out very soon, actually. Um, I'm going to say probably January or February outturn um, that is the kind of whiskey that we've bottled it at 29 years of age and it's ready to go at 29. A 30-year-old age statement would look much cooler, just like with a, a 10-year-old whiskey looks much cooler than a nine-year-old and, and and all across that. But that's not the point of the society. The point is we bottled it when it was ready. Same with this Super Trooper. It was ready as a 16-year-old. It's found it's found its footing. It's, it's that perfect marriage of spirit and cask meeting in the mi middle. And I think this is an example of uh, everything you want out of that sort of pineapple chunks, uh, vegetable soup, Bit savory and sweet, toasty spices, it says, hearty broths, fresh grass, bags of syrupy honey, cereals, and meaty richness. So the spirit character is still shining through on something like this. It's not overly encumbered by cask. It's got the hashtag team refill going on. It's a lovely refill cask that is the kind of what I would call a gentle sipper. Something you could share around, and especially if it, this is almost the kind of whiskey that if someone you know who isn't that um familiar with car strength whiskey with high proof whiskey spirit straight from the cask like this is um this would be almost the perfect introduction rather than something that would blow their heads off at 70 percent or something stupid like that no whiskey should be bottled at 70 percent. by the way i'm gonna leave my subjective opinions out of that though hmm. well um i'll see if there's any questions now that Matt's disparaged Tim Duckett and he's playing 70% whiskey. Hey, 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 hey. Hold on a second, hold on a second. Yeah, one uh, thing about uh, Tupupo is Matt's got it in for Tim Duckett. Yeah, that's what I picked up yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Duckett and Tim Duckett. First of all, first of all, first of all, before, before you see my name in my name, I'm a huge fan of Tim. He's a good friend. Uh, and uh, he's, and he's, he's a model. 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 So, so he gets stuff. The, the last above seventy percent whiskey I had, Sean gave me a taste of the Bellwether from yeah. WA, and that was seventy odd percent, wasn't it? Seventy point seven. Seventy point seven. You bought it down Hobart yeah. whiskey. Or? It might make an appearance tomorrow. Yeah. 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 I I I, I, I get it. I get yeah. it. Just I just enjoy whiskey. Enjoy whiskey. Yeah. But 68, 69%, like the last few Glen Rothers Distillery 30s through the, uh, they're, they're perfectly fine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pickle your light. Any questions for Matt on the first one? Yeah, Dave, how are you doing? Yeah, Dave, how are you doing? Yeah, who comes up with the names? Ah, the tasting panel the tasting come up with the names. Up with the names. Um, um, they have a lot they of fun with it. So just explain uh, the panel uh, for everyone briefly, Matt. Sorry, what was that, Mark? Just explain the tasting panel to everyone briefly. The tasting panel is a group of individuals. It's usually between sort of uh, 8 to 11 people on each panel session that taste these whiskey samples as presented by the casking team, and they're presented to the tasting panel completely blind. They don't know the distillery code, the distillery, the cask type, the age, nothing. Oh. They are completely assessing the spirit on the merits of the spirit. Um, and so there's no influence given. And as, as a result of the no influence aspect of the society, um, we the identities of the tasting panel remain largely hidden. I, I've been working for the SMWS for six years, and I, I, I actually don't know half the panel. Uh, I know some of them, but I don't know about half of them. And there's there's a good reason for that. We, even the, the branches around the world that, help manage the society don't know the tasting panel there can't be any sort of like influence or you should pass this one or uh sexy codes should always get through kind of approach uh, and I, I really like that that they're passed on merit we actually we, there's some fascinating stories of casks that have been um knocked back and they found out afterwards what they'd knocked back and they said well that's that's a shame but that's the way it goes um there were some uh 19 and 22 year old heaven hill casks that all got denied there were some uh, 35 and 37 year old Glen Glassow casks that all got blocked back, and there were some even 40 plus Glen Farkless casks that all got blocked as well. Uh, the, it, it's the current pass rate for the panel is about 52 53 percent, so that means about 47 percent of what is tasted is rejected. 
if it's not good enough to be bottled by the society, we don't bottle it. If it's not, if it gets rejected because it's too young, let it sit a bit longer. If it gets rejected because it's too old, then don't, you know, um, uh, you know, then it's not going to get bottled. It's going to get blended or mixed up or something. Um, um, but it has to be. As for the names, um, the names come about from the tasting panel. Um, and they like to have a bit of fun with it, but it's meant to be descriptive of the flavor. So super trooper sort of alliteration, soupy notes, savory, brothy mix kind of thing going on there. And I agree with that one. Um, generally speaking, if you find the tasting, if you find the name of the whiskey to be particularly sort of like formulaic and um, straightforward, like crackers and breeze from this month's mall of the month, I think that's probably been named by Charlie or someone like that on the panel. Uh, if you see something like Easy Peasy or Dark Lord of Stromness, that's probably been written by Madeline on the panel. But if you see something like, um, uh, if you see something like uh, Serge Valentin's Mustache Wax or Skunk Roadkill or something, something a bit sort of like quite offensive or a bit of fun, that's probably uh, Angus. So he's responsible for usually the, the wild stuff because Angus is wild. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> So we'll move on to the final SCWS round tonight. Um, and it is vastly different than the one that you're experiencing now, even though it's from the same distillery. So yeah, take that away, Matt. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll lead up to that one. Um, like I said, I had some, I had some, um, bear, bear with me in my slideshow here. There, there's the Whitehorse bottling. Um, as a, this, was, this was the staple of what this distillery went into for a long time. And this is where a lot, some of it goes into these days. I'm not really sure I agree with a 12-year-old whiskey being called Ancestral, uh, the Ancestor, maybe, um, married in oak casks. Uh, that means it's usually been through something that looks like a ton process, and they do actually marry a lot of the Jewish stock in very, very large casks. That one's even quite small. That's an 1,100 litre. Um, anyway, let's move on to a 44.116 pirate ship in a storm. Now, I'm going to start by saying this was probably the most, not the most, maybe, maybe, probably one of the most divisive drams, divisive casks ever bottled by the society. Let's have a look at the stats. It's in the deep, rich, and dried fruits category. Uh, pirate ship in a storm. Barrels of rum and raisin ice cream rolled from the glass with Brazil nuts and prune juice as truffle oil merged with maple syrup and walnuts. Not every whiskey needs to be smooth or hugely integrated. Every some They just have to be unique. They have to be interesting. This whiskey divided members. We, and I love the whiskeys that divide members. We have some casks that some members say, that was my favorite whiskey of all time. We have some casks that me members say, God, I hated that cask. And they're kind of my favorite whiskeys because they're so, they are so unique. They're not just like, oh, that's, you know, oh, that's nice. That's enjoyable. This one is this one is going to knock you about. And this one is like, a, like I, was just, I was just ranting and raving about 70% whiskeys, but this one's 68.2%. So it is an absolute slap in the face on proof. It's a second fill, ex Oloroso, but full maturation, eight-year-old, um, 44. So this is an example of spirit, and I think I, I get a little bit of cast offer on this. And and I and not in a bad way. Again, I was talking before about how it's not just it's not just good or bad. It's 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 unique to that profile, and it can really sort of knock your senses around a bit. And I think this is an example of a whiskey that absolutely knocks your senses around a bit let's have a let's i'm gonna pour that one i haven't poured it yet um it's it's a, a truly sort of like visceral whiskey this one it's it's almost like uh this whiskey for me is almost like a naval rum uh if if any fans of any naval rums out here like it is it this is yeah, I, I, I can see Heather. I know you are, but um, <laughs> it, it, this is almost like a naval rum of a 44. Uh, this is like a 44 produced a naval rum, which is absurd, but it, there's there's a bit of that sort of like acetone um, like uh, nail varnish sort of note going on in the, on the nose. There's there's that, I get the Brazil nut, like that sort of Brazil nut skins going on as well. Um, and uh, maple syrup, walnuts, it, it's this is the kind of whiskey you're going to love or hate. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, maybe, maybe everyone loves it. Maybe everyone hates it. Maybe it splits the room like it split our membership. But that's okay. But this is kind of – this is also a really good example to show the diversity of what the society plays with in distilleries. 
if you've even got just an empty glass or a drop left of the previous one, do a side-by-side -side of these two and tell me you call them the same distillery. I, I would challenge you in a, in, a, in a thousand years to call that the same distillery. They are so uh, diverse and so far apart. One is a 16-year-old refill. One is an eight-year-old just ball terror. And that's kind of the fun. That's kind of the fun of, of diversity in the spirit that is offered up by the society to its members. Uh, any questions for Matt? Yep. Uh, hi, Matt. Hi. Hi. Um, I want to ask about White Horse. Because I recognize that voice. Hello. Yes, it's me. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, White Horse used to be really popular, um, and you'd see it all over the place. Well, certainly back in Scotland, it was uh, pretty huge. One of the more popular blends, that and the original Black Bottle, um, which is another classic. Um, but now, you know, it's very hard to get hold of. You basically don't see it. Um, I've heard that it might be like a villain's fault because they really scaled back on what they're putting into blend. Does it have anything to do with, yeah, like, do you know anything about the backstory of that or, or what's going on with that? Love to get the hands on some. Is that? Is that? Do you have one? So I said, Matt. So, so, so again, again, the white horse blend as yeah. opposed yeah. to who was yeah. ready tonight. Yeah, they've scaled it right back. And, and a lot of that probably came from the relationship of White Horse and Lagavulin. And Lagavulin pretty much don't sell to blenders at all anymore. They do a little bit. Like, it's bugger all, though. Uh, they also don't sell to independent bottlers. So if you see a um, – and I know, like, that is, like, fact they don't sell to IBs. It's not like they don't sell to society and they might sell to others. They don't sell to IBs at all. There's literally, like, three – uh, Diageo distilleries that we don't have access to and they don't supply access to at all. Uh, and so, um, and one of them is like a woman. So that might have something to do with the fact that, that you know, they also, you've got to remember like like is one of those distilleries that they're one of the few DCL distilleries that still have a 16 year old age statement printed on a bottle as well. Uh, and never mind my gripes with how they package and market that, but they, the fact is that they, have that and they trying to maintain that, which would be probably the reason why. Also, I mean, White Horse is a brand sort of got swallowed up at that time of, of Diageo's ownership of the brand and they sort of didn't really continue it beyond calling certain things like the Lagavulin and White Horse edition and there was a Dalwini White Horse and there's a few others that came out at the same time, but that wasn't really, I don't think they're really continuing that and I don't think that sort of lineage has has maintained. It's a, there's, a, there's so many old blending houses and blending blended brands that, we don't see anymore and i think that's a shame and uh, my, my by the way for those wondering my my whiskey collection personally is a mixture of society bottlings and old blends like that's i obsess over that stuff and and also curious of australian distilling but this is this is kind of like um i think that's that's probably it it's probably just supply and demand of that brand and and understanding where where they can supply casks and spirit from and i think that's what sort of killed white horse in the end but yeah so the picture of Kogeliki that was up before, it now says John Dewars and Sons in front of the distillery. It used to say White Horse. And in my defence, I have some White Horse, and I consulted with Matt and Tom about which I should do tonight as well. And Graham, and they said, oh, Kogeliki's definitely Dewars. Do the Dewars, not the White Horse. So yeah. I saved the White Horse for another day. Yeah, probably not a regular tasting. I want to know when they're going to do that. Yeah. We have a question from Andrew. Andrew, um, Andrew. Um, I think it's a self-fulfilling question because I probably won't ask it myself. It's not super high alcohol content, but size, and 560 odd bottles out to would be quite a high. Sorry, I'm struggling with you. Yeah, we'll try again. Um, 567 bottle out to for 68%, which would indicate quite a tight cask, and it's a buck. But it just still seems quite a high number of release for the size. Is it purely because of that? That's maxing know? out. I think what Andrew's saying is they're totally maxing out the, the butt size um, for the amount of bottles released if they're 560 bottles from this single butt at that ABV. Yeah. 
It must yeah. all be back. But remember, at that ABV, it's got a lot more spirit still in the butt than if it dropped to 55% or something. They would have lost volume, wouldn't they, yeah, yeah. So because it's such high ABV, it's still close to the original feel of volume. Yeah, it, 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 it hasn't moved it hasn't much. Moved much. It is. Um, it's it's matured for eight years in a refill butt, but it's in a second sorry second fill butt Ola Rosso, but it's um it that means that would have indicated a fairly high fill strength to begin with, which a lot of distilleries in Scotland now are moving towards. Um, and so that's why maybe a sixteen year old expression like the previous one has dropped to fifty five because maybe that was filled at sixty three, um, but um, now uh, uh, in the last especially last decade, a lot of distilleries have been pushing towards. 69.9 as their fills so it's only lost a couple of percent over over eight years which is not unusual for a, a, a quite a tight um tight sherry but um and that's and that's going to be that's going to be a, a key inf influence here as well um but yeah it's a very it's a i'd love to hear any other thoughts on that whiskey because it's a very spirit forward uh very sort of wild beast of a whiskey and it's it's not my i'll be honest it's not my favorite i i prefer the 134 but it's i i get it I, it's it's such a it's certainly going to divide and conquer this one in a in a good way it's it's it will spark some discussion spark some discussion do you have another question he's bloody horrible <laughs> <laughs> if you're wondering if you can taste uh cask sulfur or not by the way um if you're identifying it i personally this is just an anecdote but personally, I find if you have a taste at full proof and then breathe out afterwards, like um, if you get that sort of like, uh, it's almost like a, a dusty, like um, railroad track, steel works kind of tin shed breathe out moment. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but if you breathe out on a whiskey and you get like a really rich maltiness on your mouth and it's like, there's probably no cast off of there. It's it's you're getting a lot of the, the the malt character coming through. But if you breathe that and you get that railroad tracks and tin shed and maybe a little bit of egginess on on the breathe out, that's that for me is almost like the, the indicator. The sulfur for me is almost always on the finish. It's a little bit on the nose. It's a little bit on the palate. But it's like the bulk of it's on the finish. It's just this like this fire breathing dragon of sulfur on the finish. And for some some and there are there's a certain percentage of the population that don't detect sulfur at all. And I, I don't know what that percentage is, and I don't know if that's even been properly researched and whatnot. But it's uh, it's certainly an interesting point because some of you will just won't get it, and that's and that's I almost I actually envy you because it's <laughs> you, you can enjoy this whiskey without having that <sighs> that fire up, that breathe out at the end. Sorry, Mark, over to you. Um, uh, where so I'll bring up that. There we are. There's the 44.116 pirate ship in a store. Yep. Um, pardon me. We're actually, uh, I'll just, just finish up on a couple of the last little sort of society things that I wanted to touch on tonight on the screen here. Um, anyone who's not a member already, we're actually giving away a three dram pack for every everyone who joins up by default at the moment. There's three cool casks in there. Coco Nut, Magic is So Strong, and Day is Fading West Away. That middle one is a 26-year-old whiskey from a destroyed distillery, so that's kind of a cool little um, piece of history right there. Um, look at these! Look at these characters! Look at these handsome individuals on the screen right now! Just really take a moment to really look at these handsome individuals. <laughs> now, you only see people this good looking at our Tasmanian events. So, if you've not been to one, there's a Christmas in the Park coming up, uh, which our Tasmanian state manager Tom Roff, who um who uh Ali needs to slap across the face for really throwing her in the deep end tonight. Um these characters will probably be there. So that's you should you should meet them. We've also got a great partner bar in Tasmania, the new Sydney Hotel in Hobart. Um there's their most recent outturn. They're already getting properly destroyed, those bottles. That most of them are at half or, or below. So they're they're sort of really getting hit hard and uh well worth dropping into the new Sid. We love those guys there. Love Simon and the team, and they're doing great stuff. And um, we have a great team at the Society across the world. Um, there's, I always show a photo of the local team, but I want to show a photo of our Glaswegian team. Good-looking characters. I don't know many of them. I know about half of them. But that's our, that's a photo from our new um, Bath Street venue in Glasgow uh, with the bottle lockups and uh, and goodies behind them as well. So, but that's that's all that's all I want to touch on just to just to finish with and thank you so much for um having me along and I'm extremely bummed that I can't be here in person right now
to Zoom again. If anyone does want to join up to the society, do please let me know. Um, Tom and I always have membership discount codes to get you around thirty dollars off a membership and very off options. As Matt said, at the moment till the end of the year, you get a free three gram sample pack if you sign up as a member. Whack down a member who's in the room tonight, and they get one too as a referral bonus. Um, tonight, Matt, we do actually have a member who is turning fit or turned 50 recently, and some of the Sally's crew came up, especially to go to his birthday. So, yeah, on behalf of myself and Ali, I'll present uh, Gary with the. Hey, hey Gary, is it Gary? Is it Bloody helmet. Bloody yeah, helmet. helmet. <laughs> and it even has my favourite distillery uh, 68 in this um, pack too, Gary, so you'll be happy to munch on that. But thanks again to Matt for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. First time. It's a legend. We hope you come back and join us. And uh, yeah, we'll let him finish the pack and have a good evening, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Folks. <laughs> Love you all. See you all soon. See you all soon. In December, in Hobart for the festive event with with yeah. Tom. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. Thanks. The B grade. No rush, hang around, drink your jams and grams. Um, so is for our questions. As I said, QR code in third of December might be the last one this year, so um, you know, get get in your tickets quick. If you don't want to use your QR code, walk up to the kiosk and buy it there. Uh, take your time. If you have any questions, just come and ask. What's the distillery on the third? The distillery on the third, very happy to say. That remnants are returning for the triumphant third time. We'll be featuring their newest release, The Herd Not Seen, a reference to when the previous owner of Nant was trying to sell Angus beef, Wagyu cattle that didn't exist. And it's always a great night. Obviously, they have an amazing good price point, bottles will be used for sale. And the distillery. Uh, Will be Newport Distillery 39 will be the vertical tasting, so that's really rather special as well. I have two independent bottlers who, so Australian importers of independent bottlers from the mainland will be zooming in on that night. So not the full one like Matt, it'll be mostly me talking, but we'll throw to a couple of independent bottlers on the night. One of them will be an exclusive if it arrives in time, brand new Australian independent bottling of Newport, with a new independent bottler called Bears Dame. But um, look, thanks again to the Sully's crew for coming. Thanks to Heather for speaking. <laughs> if you're in your in your home, you'd be insane not to swing out to Cambridge and meet the crew at the at the uh, So please enjoy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.